we're really at the ability now to um, be able to take things and give them an ability to do one thing. Um, this idea of a collective consciousness and collective intelligence, um, is it possible? Yes, it is theoretically possible to um, allow these things to have a collective intelligence and that is artificially. Um, it still is today though. Um, the intelligence that is offered into a device is still, um, how would I, it's ring fenced by the intelligence of the person that developed it. So we have not got to the point yet. You know, there has been some experimentation and there's been some people who have posited, you know, algorithms that can get to the point where we can, you know, it can learn in of itself, but it still only learns about the things that we teach it. Welcome to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for people like you who care about the social impact of conscious companies and everyday heroes. Hear inspiring stories from those who put people and planet before profit and personal gain. You'll learn how you can make a difference, vote with your dollars, and get involved today. Here's your host, Karina Belizzi. Hello, fellow do-gooders and friends. I'm your host, Karina Belizzi, an activist and cause marketer who's passionate about making a better, brighter future for all of us. Every week, I invite you to learn with me and care a little bit more about specific issues so that together we can build a better world and a better future. Today, we're going to explore the Internet of Things, otherwise known as IOT, from the unique perspective of someone whose start in business came from the hard labor of running a cattle ranch. Rob Rastovich has been actively in technology for 30 years, from building e-commerce sites at what was the dawn of our present state of doing business in this way, using AWS and IOT, when things were, let's just say, in their infancy. ThingLogix, his company, was awarded the 2018 IoT Platforms Leadership Award. When he's not working on his role leading the Internet of Things, he can be found maintaining his cattle ranch and being a part of his community in Central Oregon. Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks, Karina. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's so nice to have you here. Um, I also am from Southern Oregon, so it's been a while. I've yet to be up to Bend, but perhaps <laughs> one day soon you can show me what you do differently at that cattle ranch. No, absolutely. Absolutely. We'd love to have you anytime. <laughs> so let's start off this conversation with a simple review of what the Internet of Things really is. So I guess most simply put, it's the ability to connect devices that typically wouldn't be connected. So, uh, you know, I think the most the most uh, common example is smart homes, right? Smart homes are, are pretty prevalent around, you know, you can connect your thermostat, you can connect your garage door, you can, you know, have all these things talk amongst themselves and talk to you. Um, the thermostat can, you know, tell the windows, to, tell the drapes to go up, up and down and the garage door can tell the lights to go on and off and things can talk to each other. Well, all those things um, only talk to each other is if they have the ability to send messages. So the internet of things is really uh, managing messages and uh, between devices and people. Is artificial intelligence involved with how they communicate? Absolutely. So, you know, that's kind of where ThingLogix got its start. Um, so originally, we actually had we had another company called Telemetry um, that was out in Denver. We actually developed the ability to you know manage and ingest these messages. Um, that co company was ultimately acquired by AWS and is today what AWS refers to as the a AWS IoT broker. And so that was kind of the first step. Can you? How do you? How do you get messages from one device to the other? Now taking and adding logic to things, ergo thing logics, um, is the ability to take artificial intelligence and put it onto these devices and make them smart enough to know not that not that every time that they have to do something, but when they have to do something and when they need to talk to other things and when they need to translate um, data from one point to the other. So, so would this be called a narrow approach to artificial intelligence or is it broader? Um, I would say that's a good question. I would say we are pretty broad in the sense of we we really talk about putting logic against anything. So I would say 
you know, um, we, you know, we have logic and intelligence that we put on against a farm. We have uh, intelligence we put against a volcano, um, migrating geese, um, you know, smart um, UPSs, um, you name it. We have a very broad approach. The more specific stuff in terms of algorithms that get down to, you know, when and how you do things and uh, whatnot, that would be, um, you know, kind of a case by case implementation. I guess the reason I ask is because I have an earlier interview where I um, spoke with Mo Gaudat, who used to be the chief business officer at Google X, and he wrote a book called Scary Smart, all about how artificial intelligence is really ultimately going to surpass the collective knowledge of humanity in relatively short order, the next 20, 30 years. And ultimately, it will learn from us, from our behaviors, and will either be really good for us or potentially pretty bad. So mm -hmm. I think some people misunderstand its involvement and in, in approach in something like a smart home concerning thoughts being along the lines of, oh, well, how much is it learning about me? And what is it going to share with the universe, so to speak? And is that technology secure? So what would you have to say to that individual who might have some concern about these things? Well, it, you know, that's usually, you know, I get that question a lot is, are, you know, are we, are, am, am I creating Big Brother? <laughs> am, am I, have I been creating basically this monster that cannot be turned off? So um, with today's technology, that, that is not the case, you know, and I do think we, you know, we, we tend to extrapolate out to that point. We're really at the ability now to um, be able to take things and give them an ability to do one thing. Um, this idea of a collective consciousness and collective intelligence, um, is it possible? Yes, it is theoretically possible to um, allow these things to have a collective intelligence and that is artificially. Um, it still is today, though. Um, the intelligence that is offered into a device is still, um, how would I, it's ring fenced by the intelligence of the person that developed it. So we have not got to the point yet. You know, there has been some experimentation and there's been some people who have posited, you know, algorithms that can get to the point where we can, you know, it can learn in of itself, but it still only learns about the things that we teach it. And um, the, the scary part to me is that, um, and it's not unlike, it, it's not unlike our, you know, how we teach our children. You know, you can have a child and that child kind of, you know, objectively comes into the world and is taught by its parents and its community and its society. Um, it absorbs data, it learns behaviors, it does all those things. So you could actually say that that child is a product of its, you know, programmer, if you will. And it can grow up to be do good things and it can grow up to do, you know, less than optimal things. And intelligence and artificial intelligence, I don't think is, is much different than that. It's what you put into it and how that um, how that learning takes place. Today, the type of intelligence that we have and the compute power that we have is is greater than it has ever been in, in the history um, um, of mankind. And so, yeah, could we could it go down that road? Yeah, it's possible. I don't see it in a practical sense as us being there uh, right now just for the sheer amount of data that that we have to process. So let's talk about what you do specifically at ThingLogix. Where, what is a sweet spot that you're the master of? So our real, our, um, so after we, after the acquisition of um, our broker to Amazon, ThingLogix was actually born out of that to provide professional services around this technology. So. Um, essentially, think about it like, um, and to use agriculture, which is near and dear to my heart, you have a sensor that sits out in the field and it, it measures moisture and it measures maybe nutrients of, you know, what's in the, in the soil. And it just sends that data up, sends it 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 up. That's all it knows how to do. And that's all it can do. Thing logic has to, or somebody or something has to come in and put context and you know around that thing okay that thing is in the north field on the rastovich farm you know in the southeast you know in the southeast corner of the north field and in there we're going to plant potatoes 
and it's connected to you know this water system and it has this nutrients available so now we have to put the ability to all right we're going to send moisture from this pump and we're going to send these types of nutrients because we know it's going to be potatoes in there and all of that kind of stuff that puts context around it and kind of makes an application if you will um, is what thing logics does very similar think about an e-commerce site if you just had i have a product and i have a widget and I have a web page for my widget. Okay, well, now we need to put an application around that. You need to be able to add the widget to the basket, and you be able to need to accept the credit card, and you need to send it to fulfillment, and you need to be able to do all these other things around just the fact that it has it. And that's really what ThingLogic does. We develop that framework and that, that ability to actually create a solution or an application, if you will, around devices. Well, that sounds like it's making it more accessible than to other device manufacturers, people who want to create something new or, or ultimately take the power of that tracking into their own hands. It does. And it's, you know, it's it, we really kind of sit between the device manufacturer and kind of the business. Um, you know, great example. I, have, I had a, a guy come to me one time and he, he said, uh, and this was in the early days, he wanted to build a new, he went, he's a pool. He had a pool business where he, you know, clean pools and he says, I want to build a new website so people can go onto my website and they can, you know, they can schedule an appointment for repairs and they can order chemicals and, you know, we can do their payments and all that kind of stuff. And it seemed like a good idea. And he goes, well, I, I could increase my business. I said, well, I think we're thinking about that in the wrong way. In today's world, we're moving to a subscription economy and a, mm -hmm. a connected economy. I go, instead of spending your money on you know having trying to get customers to come to your website let's take and take a connected pool pump and install a connected pool pump that measures your chemicals and dispenses that and sends back diagnostics equipment so now the instead of you know your customers having to go to your website and have to do something your business model changes completely you say okay well i'm not going to charge you you know 100 bucks a month or whatever and your chemicals are going to arrive automatically uh, we're going to come out and schedule maintenance preventatively because we know your pump is going to you know, has a, has the a profile of a pump that might fail in you know two weeks instead of the day before the pool party. Um, you know we're going to we're going to proactively work on these kinds of things instead of waiting for you to request it and then we respond and request a response. So, Thing Logics has the ability to sit in the middle and build that solution so that you know device manufacturers like the the pool pump manufacturer and the business like the guy who's running around cleaning pools can actually create a new business model. Well, it sounds to me like that would be incredibly powerful even for the last or I guess by the time this airs, it'll be a few episodes ago. But I interviewed um, the CEO and founder of Delfast eBikes, and mm. they are collecting data all the time on the performance of their vehicles and can ultimately slurp that up into the cloud and then share it with their um, the purchasers of their e-bikes. It can even track where their bicycles are if they have mm. been subject to theft or something along those lines. And they can also track the temperature of the batteries so that if there is a failure predicted, it can be addressed before a problem arises. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's a great, that's a great uh, example, being able to provide a solution and all those little things the battery, the bike, you know, all those manufacturers put that together and they came up with a business case that says, hey, let's put a, a solution together that didn't exist before. And those are, those are, you know, that's, you know, technology like those, like Uber, um, those are technologies that, you know, that didn't exist and couldn't have existed without a, you know, message based, you know, back and forth type of architecture. Wow. Well, I would like to just know a little bit more about how being a cattle rancher prepared you for this life yeah. in technology. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. So I've been, I'm third generation uh, rancher. So my uh, the ranch I live on, we're 102 years old. My grandfather um, founded the ranch in 1919. Um, and so I always tell people, I don't know, it's, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a cattle rancher because I don't think I know how not to be a rancher. It's, it's kind of in my <laughs> blood. I, I grew up here. Uh, my father grew up here. I would say my grandfather and all my uh, aunts and uncles 
um, grew up here as well. So that was kind of, you know, from day one, I was on the trajectory of, of being a rancher. The technology kind of came in, you know, I actually started off, went to school to be, uh, um, you know, to do marketing. And when the Internet kind of poked its head up and in the mid to late 90s, uh, I caught the I caught the technology bug. And that was <laughs> that was the crack cocaine I couldn't get enough of. You know, well, I mean, I you and everyone I went to high school with in yeah. Silicon Valley. I mean, I was in Cupertino, right? You know, as that was erupting into something yeah. gigantic. And for some reason, I strayed from the industry. I was one who said, I want to work in something more naturally oriented. And but yet every every man I dated for a long, long time <laughs> yeah. was a technologist. My husband works for Joby Aviation. Okay, so yeah. they're, you know. Yeah. working in the VTOL space, vertical takeoff and landing. I'm still here in Northern California, which is a hotbed for all of that. So mm -hmm. technology surrounds me every single day and I get the appeal. I also am a marketer and I use a lot of these tools. I'm, I'm really marveling at the fact um, that our jobs have become so much more easy with these gifts that technology mm -hmm. has provided just because we can really get to know our customers better and differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are ways to create surveys or questionnaires that enable you to learn more about your customer base than you might ever have been able to in the past. And I'm sure you're going to tell me about more solutions. <laughs> well, we have we have a we have a full bag of them, that's for sure. Um, and we have, you know, and I when I once I got that bug, I couldn't stop it. And so the technology kind of grew out around, you know, around that. And so but I never gave up the ranching because uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a grounding, it's, you know, it's a grounding place for me. So they work well together. So what kind of technology do you use specifically on the ranch? Well, we're, we kind of use the ranch as kind of a proof of concept, you know, to do a POC. So I've done, uh, we've done POCs around soil monitoring. What is a POC? Uh, proof of concept. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, um, so we've done, Proof of concepts around soil monitoring and fertigation. You know, so the ability to, when you irrigate, to you know not just send water out, but to send nutrients out. Um, in Oregon, as you know, um, industrial hemp was legal. It became legal a few years ago. I put in hemp crops, put in 20 acres of hemp. Uh, experimented um, at that time. Uh, Boston Dynamics had a, a the dog spot. You know that could a robotic dog that could walk up and down the aisles and look for plants and do weeding and you know because inside the hemp process if you have a, a male plant gets inside your crop it's it's really bad for it so you got to constantly monitor for that um so explain with that um with the cattle uh we start experimenting with smart corral systems so mm -hmm. you know currently you know today you know the cow that goes to market is the slowest cow the one you can catch easiest right <laughs> um but really, that's probably not the most efficient way to manage a herd. So we're working on corral systems so that because all the cows have RFID tags. And so as they walk through, you know, we know which cow comes in and whatnot. But being able to simply do things like, you know, close a gate when you know that, OK, the cows are coming in, they're coming in for water, they come in for feed. And, you know, there's four or five hundred cattle out there. And so as the one that you want comes in. You just kind of close the gate behind her. Um, yeah, you catch a few extras in, in the corral, but it's easier to sort one out of five than it is one out of 500. Mm -hmm. uh, so being able to do smart corral systems that, you know, manage a herd and be able to, it makes it less stress on the animal, makes it safer for the handlers, those kinds of things. Um, and then we've experimented a lot with, uh, we actually spun up another company called Thermix AI around cold chain monitoring so mm. being able to so obviously when we when we have processed meat we put it in the freezer and those freezers you know have tens of thousands of dollars worth of product in it and if a, a freezer were to fail for some reason we want to know that right away like if the temperature goes up one degree i want to know immediately um so putting um sensors in there to manage the freezers and manage that cold chain from the point of processing all the way to um, when we send it to our customers. Well, this is something that my listeners may remember from an earlier episode when we interviewed Manik Suri of Therma. Um, they manage specifically fixed refrigeration units, but you're talking about end-to-end -end as well, correct? Yeah. Collecting data all along the way. Yeah, wow. correct. Yeah. 
So I'm thinking about a couple of things here. One is I visited a, um, what I would call a humanitarian style dairy farm up in Wisconsin at one point, and they had a technology where their cows, they all had RFID tags like you're talking about, they would choose when it was time to be milked. And so mm. they would come into the building, literally walk through, they knew where to walk to go ahead and line up and be milked. And then they'd walk out of the building. And every step of the way, these things are tagged. They know which cow came in at what time, how much milk they received. All of that is cataloged and um, ultimately mm. preserved. And the cow walks out. Less stress on the cow, less stress on overall workflow. Um, the cows essentially know when it's time to be relieved of their milk, so they'd come in and, and ha be processed ultimately. And so I felt like that was such an interesting approach to doing this entire process. Less stressful. Mm -hmm. I mean, the data was all there and um, really felt like it was novel and would support, you know, people who might have chosen to stop drinking milk specifically for how often dairy cows are treated to mm. consider adding it back if they didn't have a sensitivity. Mm -hmm. I'm dairy sensitive, so I'm working to eliminate dairy from my diet. But, um, you know, that's one primary reason for me anyway. Those dairy farms are amazing. Uh, I've had the opportunity to visit a couple here in Oregon um, and that were in the process of automating some of that stuff. But uh, those, and you know, there's a special place in heaven, I'll tell you, for dairy farmers because it's, <laughs> it's a lot of work. It, Oh my gosh, it's 4 a.m. and 4 p.m. every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, and it's a lot of work, um, what they do. But those cattle, they do, you know, they get they get used to it and and they they treat those animals. I mean, you know, I always say, you know, the farmer is the original conservationist. I mean, um, there's no there's no person that cares more, or, you know, nurtures more the land and the people in the and the animals on it than than the farmers and are there exceptions yeah are there abuses of course but you know there is most of the ranchers and farmers that you'll meet um they are or at least the ones that i have done have i deal with around family farms and family ranchers mm -hmm. um, the amount of care and nurturing that goes into their animals and their land and and making sure that it, it is viable not just for you know, this season or next season, but for generations. Yeah. I mean, what you're talking uh, about, again, is not the, the concentrated animal farming operations, the CAFOs, right? Like, that's a completely Correct, different yeah. story. And I think mm -hmm. when you get to know your food sources, like, for instance, if I was to come to your farm and get cattle, um, get meat from your farm, you know, I'm talking to a specific rancher who's been doing this mm -hmm. work on the same land for three generations, who's taken extra care and who I understand is even feeding mash from from beer processing to your cows can you talk yeah. to us about this yeah so our little town of bend oregon um in the mid 90s was one of well, one of the one of the very first uh, towns that started doing microbrewing and we have one of our largest brewers here is deschutes brewing they distribute nationally but we have on the order of magnitude you know 10 barrel <clears throat> is a pretty national uh, popular national brand boneyard pretty national popular national brand so we have some large national brands that brew here and they have a product, a byproduct of beer making that is, uh, we call it a beer mash that they have to dispose of and you can't, and it's just basically the grains and the wheats that go into making individual, you know, those proteins are kind of soaked out of that, that grain. And that's what gives you your beer, the flavor, and that's what makes an IPA an IPA and, uh, you know, a blonde, a blonde and those kinds of things. And but when they're done with that, that needs to go someplace and it can't go into the sewage system because it, it messes up the, the processing plants. You can't take it to the landfill because it's a, a wet product. So, you know, you have to you have to do something. So we pick that up and we feed that to the cows. Um, and then we sell each of those pubs have um, each of those brewers have little pubs in town. We sell the meat back to the pubs so that when you you know, when you come into town and you have a burger and a beer, you're eating a burger raised on the beer uh, that you're drinking. Then is we all part of flavor into the meat. I'm just curious. It, it, it absolutely, does. yeah, it absolutely does. Uh, you know, there's, you know, you'll have, you know, there's, there's a traditional grass-fed um, animal, and then there's more of a, you know, what people would call a feedlot corn-fed animal, uh, where um, they're fattened up more on a starchy, like a like corn, or kind of someplace in the middle. You know, so we get a lot of grass fed, but they don't get a lot of starch. So they end up with a 
a marbling and a flavor that is closer to, you know, uh, a corn fed um, animal than it would be a grass fed, you know, grass fed would be leaner, a little more gamier. Um, so, but yes, it definitely does affect um, the taste. In my opinion, it's better, but I guess I'm a biased person. <laughs> Well, I'm very curious, I must say. We'll have to figure out a way to get some of that to me. And my yes, husband yeah. will expertly grill it because that's <laughs> his, um, his, his master chef level um, was, has nice. been attained in the outdoor cooking world. Wow, nice. I do everything outside, you know, nice. inside stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk for a minute about what you have done and well, my relative local area here with United Way of Monterey County. I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Yeah, so that was an interesting one. So originally that was a pilot program. It was actually sponsored by um, Cisco. Um, and Cisco had- Cisco had, meaning the, um, the, the tech um, company or- The tech company. Okay. Yeah, not, yeah, not, yeah, there's a food company, a food distribution company called Cisco too, but this is the tech company. They had donated, um, uh, we actually we competed for it's called a thousand thousand people out of poverty was their um, was the pilot program um, and the goal there was to um, you know be able to manage um, you know uh, indigent care across services so there was always there's there were people that, you know, there are organizations that provide food banks and then there's job training and then there's shelter and then there's, um, you know, clothing and, you know, the, those types of services. And then there's mental health. And each one of those services were, you know, kind of disparaging and disconnected from the other. And so what they wanted to do was come up with a, a way to um, make sure that that care could go across. Um, so that when you are when you get into the system, you can um, you can manage a person's care across agencies. The challenge in that, of course, is you know distribution of data. You know that a lot of times um, indigent care doesn't have you know the, they don't have an address. They don't have you know a place to send stuff. They don't have a phone number. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you manage those things? Um, so we we put in a bit uh, more against traditional. Uh, traditional um, technologies, you know, we're, we're more database centric and we took a different approach to it. We said, you know what, we're an IoT company, but let's not just think about, you know, connecting things. What if we connected everything, right? Hmm. Um, a, the idea that um, a person is just another, uh, is, a, is a, a thing if I may be so <laughs> bold, um, that sends messages and receives messages and needs, you know, needs logic, if you will, put on it. So what we did in each of these individual health systems or providers, we said, what if we just treated those as, you know, a connected device? And they're not sending us all the data. Like, I don't want to come in and send, I don't want to come in and get all your data and create this big behemoth um, you know, a meta application of applications. I just want a little information, like who visited you? Okay, Rob came in and he got some food today. Great, and I talked to him and he may need some referrals to some shelter. Okay, well that comes back. And now because the messages acts in real time and we treat it like it's, you know, you know a real time interaction, we can immediately then send a message to the shelter and say, Rob needs some shelter. He's over here at this location right now, um, and he needs to get to there. And he's he's on his way. Okay, well, we'll expect him, or we'll look mm -hmm. for him, or maybe we'll have to go get him. Um, and then from there, I get shelter, and, and maybe I get a little more safety. And I think, you know, well, Rob needs some job training. Okay, well, we'll now give him some job training. And now someone can manage Rob in his journey out of poverty across all agencies and across all these things. And so that was really the goal. United Way took that to the next level and said, and the, it was very successful. And they said, let's do that with not just this area, but let's roll it out to other areas in Monterey and let's put other agencies in there and let's manage and, and create these interactions between um, the different uh, charities and different nonprofits and the different systems or agencies out there, um, allow them to communicate you know, across 
any individual, you know, person management system or computer system or whatnot, and give them something that's kind of a, above that. So I'm seeing that in this sort of a situation, you could better track resources, you could more effectively determine who needed help and when, but there also, it also sounds like there could be a risk and all of that information being in one spot, like that the individual might be worried that it could be used in a nefarious way against mm -hmm. them. And mm -hmm. so I, I know that in the homeless population, for example, there are those individuals who are already on the street because they fear that they're being tracked or they, they mm. don't want to go into a shelter because they fear that somebody's coming for them and that this if they had knowledge of this level of detail being taken about them maybe less likely even to go forwards with um, some of the help that they might need so i wonder what your thoughts are about that and how we might work to mitigate some of the concerns that people might have so don't think so the difference between a a meta application of an application of applications would be exactly what you're talking about we would be collecting data and analyzing that data and in attempting to you know act upon it and say okay i don't know we now got to go get this person because we know that they're going to do that ours is and the difference is um, we are what we call an event driven application so in other words i send a message and i send a message that i am here and I need uh, to be picked up for, and think of it like, you know, Uber. I send a message, I consciously, intentionally send a message and ask Uber to come get me. Somebody on the other side of that receives that message and goes, you know what? I happen to be going that way. <laughs> and if you're willing to exchange some dollars for my time and this and that, then we will have a connection and we will go and off we go. Now, at the end of the day, can Uber keep that data and do it? Yes, but what, what we have done in that is we don't act as the analysis or the application. Our job is to provide that connection. So ours is really anonymous, autonomous data moving back and forth. It exists for an event, for a okay. transaction. And well, then once that, understand. Yeah, once that event, once that transaction is done, it, doesn't, it goes into whatever system that they have. And so everybody maintains their autonomy like it does today. Sounds good to me. Now, I would like to know a little bit more about how you see this type of technology making our lives easier as time goes on, and also how it might connect with and touch on our management of environmental issues from water usage to, heck, even the inputs that we put into our gardens and lawns. I, I'm just wondering what you think um, the applications could be of this sort of technology in our daily lives. Well, you hit upon one that is is near and dear to my heart as a you know as a rancher um, and i guess as a human being water is uh like the number one thing um that we need uh i live in central oregon in a high desert climate so i actually ranch and farm in the middle of a desert so if you don't have water in the middle of a desert you're in you know it's, it's a problem um uh this year and last year have been you know really dry years for much of the Western United States and even down in the in the, the Southwest. And so we're going through a drought. So as an example, normally on my ranch, I will I'll, I will start growing crops. I start growing hay um, April 15th and then and I end and finish October 15th. Well, this year and last year, I was able to start April 15th, but I was done and I had to finish by um, July 1st. And that so was just I, because of water. Right. It had no water yet, so they turned the water off. And then, and then there's competing resources for water. This um, is why a bale of hay is so much more expensive. It, it is exactly. like something like two to three times what it was. Exactly. Hay this year is going to be, you know, if, if you have animals or horses and those kinds of things, you know, it's going to be three or four times, you know, more expensive because you just can't grow the crops. It's just not enough there. And the notion that there's, and what that really translates, it, to. It means that there's not enough water coming down the river, flowing off of the mountains and coming down the river to in order to get to the place where the food is being grown. If you travel through central uh, California to the San Joaquin Valley, you know, those guys down there, you'll see them all the time. You know, water, grow, water grows food and you need food, you need water to grow food for farmers. 
-hmm. Well, it's not that water, in, in my opinion, it's not that there's any, there's no less water on the planet now than there ever has been. It's not like we're leaking water into space. Our sea it's, levels are rising. Our, our sea levels are rising, but the water's coming from other places, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's ice that is melting. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's water is transforming into different areas and we have to manage that process. And the only way to manage something, you can't manage something if you can't measure it. Um, and so managing not just, you know, groundwater, but ice caps and ocean water and, and surface water, you need to manage that all as a system. So one of our customers is the USGS, United States Geological Services, and they have started using our this ability to ingest large amounts of data and to, you know, track everything around rivers and streams to be able to manage, you know, uh, to give a real time reading as to what's coming down the Colorado River and mm -hmm. what that Colorado River, if, if water's coming down the Colorado River up in Colorado, it affects the rancher down in Southern Texas, because that's where he's getting it. And well, in and it Southern Cal California, in Southern California, because yeah. that's where they're getting it. Mm -hmm. And being able to manage not that, you know, and let's take it up another level. Let's manage the snowpack because the snowpack is what's coming down and create the Colorado River. So all of this is connected. Our entire system, our entire world is one cause and effect after the other. But we see it as my river here in Oregon or my faucet in in Southern California or my pond in, in Southern Texas. And that, you know, that has to, you know, get out and look at that at a larger thing. And technology, our ability to start managing and measuring snowpack and groundwater and surface water and managing that water as a one whole system, I think will allow, will will and, and could very easily solve this water management problem. You look back yeah. at, you look back at the years of, you know, used to be electricity, you know, electricity back in the turn of the century, if you wanted to have a factory that, you know, had electrical, um, you know, devices, you had a power plant sitting outside your your factory, right? You had a an engine or, or a, a windmill or something that generated power so you could run it. Well, eventually we decided, well, that's silly. Why don't we just, you know, create power and put it into a grid and then would manage a grid, you know, and that's really where we need to get water. Water is a distribution problem, I think, not, a, not necessarily a supply problem. Well, I know that um, I've spent a fair amount of time on ranches myself. Um, having grew up, grown up on a small family farm, so to speak, in Southern Oregon, but then also having spent time on large horse farms, working to train horses and, you know, call it break colts, start colts, right? <laughs> um, ultimately, they even are affected because they'll dictate or the government is dictating now when, you know, you can use water, when you can have um you know, flood style irrigation, mm -hmm. and that impacts grass, that also impacts even those that have pasture where they're grazing their animals. And so they could be in meat production or minding horses and rely on those irrigation days to keep the food supply for their animals. Yeah. So I wonder if you have also explored some of the regenerative farming practices on your own farm that can help you sequester more carbon in the soil, but also hold more water in the land itself. So we do, um, and quite, um, I, I don't know, coincidentally, it's we, we use the beer for that too. Um, so another byproduct of, of the beer process, beer making process is a wastewater that comes up. So there's two things, there's mash that we actually feed the cattle but mm -hmm. then there's a wastewater that comes that's used out of that. When we spread that, uh, we take and that comes out and we spread that all over our fields. It's high in nitrogen, mm -hmm. and so but it also makes the soil and that nitrogen actually makes the soil more dense. So um, our, you know, anything that you know, when we come to springtime, it takes less water for us to generate a pasture than it would before um, because of the, the density of, of, of the ground, the nutrients that we, we get a more we get a more natural nutrient in there um, in the fall. Well, the, and, it sounds like the spring. grasses you grow love the nitrogen rich soil, right? Oh, they, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so, and we, we obviously tailor our grasses as such. 
Um, so, you know, I think there are those practices there. Are, um, a lot of the guys are now are starting to uh, change their crops out to be more water tolerant crops, you know, triticale, um, uh, crested wheat, those kinds of things where you're doing dry land crops so that the um, um, you're not, you know, they don't require as much. And in some of these new crops, in fact, the years that we put in hemp, um, hemp and doing uses a, a drip irrigation system, you know, instead of a more of a, you know, sprinkler stuff. And it, it's a very specific, it actually, you know, we could, we could, we could produce more acres of hemp with the amount of water that we had than we could produce a pasture. You know, mm -hmm. so other, other types of crops that, that we could do that. And then, you know, uh, you know, our, our cattle in terms of composting and, you know, managing those, um, you know, managing the, the, the lots and the waste of the cattle, being able to, you know, spread that out across, you know, across unproductive land that now makes it productive too. Mm -hmm. Again, the biggest problem that we face is, is water law. So uh, we, you know, if we have a hundred acres of water, we are allowed to grow a hundred acres of X, whatever it is. Um, even if I got really efficient at my use, and I could produce and I could grow 120 acres. I'm not allowed to by law to even get more efficient at that. And consequently, if I don't get my 100 acres and I only have enough to do 80 acres, I will lose 100 acres, 20 acres of water that I was not given because I didn't use it. <laughs> and yeah, so and then getting water, it back, what do you do yeah, to get it back? Exactly, right. exactly. Wow. Well, I feel like we've covered a lot of ground in this interview thus far, and I know we could keep diving into other subjects that connect to this Internet of Things, because guess what? We're all connected at this point. <laughs> Technology yeah. continues to grow in our lives and Absolutely. help us manage all sorts of resources. So I'd just like to ask you, is there a question that I haven't asked that you wish I had? If so, you can ask and answer it. If not, I'd love to hear some parting words from you. What would you have our audience think about as we leave today's discussion. Oh, no, I mean, I, I, I really enjoyed the discussion and I, I, I think you've taken us in all the areas that are, are pertinent. And I guess the one thing that I would, you know, um, I would say, and I get, I, you know, I get this a lot, uh, you know, to, to come back to what he says, is um, I think a lot of times, that, you know, technologists and ranchers, um, both of us get vilified for, for different reasons. You know, um, one of us is creating big brother. The other was, is destroying the planet. Uh, and, um, I, I would say, you know, uh, you know, find, find a local farmer and befriend them a little bit and learn a little bit. And I invite you to come out to the ranch and we do tours here all the time and kind of show people, but don't be afraid of either one of them. You know, I think technology has its place. Anything obviously can be used for good or not. And um, technology has a lot of benefits that we experience in our daily life. And I think it's going to, you know, continue to do that. It's going to shape our world and it will in a very positive way. Things like telemedicine that we're seeing now. And but the, the same thing with your, your local farmer. I know it's often more difficult to, you know, talk to your local farmer, but the, the problem with the local farmers is they became farmers because they weren't good at public relations. There's a reason <laughs> they become farmers, right? And we need, you know, they, but they're, they, they are a, a, a very um, kind and gentle and loving group of people, but you yeah, reach out to those local guys and, and help support them. Um, because I think if that, that relationship, that connection, if you will, between the local farmer and the local consumer, really can um, start to see big changes in in how how we work as a as an economy and as a society well i couldn't agree with you more the reality is there's a human face to those local farmers in your area and i've always been somebody who shares with my community you know if you can shop local go to your farmer's market guess yeah. what if you have a local rancher there that sells meat locally they are probably there with a stand too yeah. we have examples here that are farming for yeah. lamb for cattle for seafood 
you know, they're, they're here and they're offering their wares in the local environment. There's even a chicken farmer who has pictures of their individual chickens up in their That's booth awesome. to show you the personal face to the flock that they have. <laughs> um, and one of the things I love about that particular farmer is even though they haven't gone through the process of becoming organic certified, because there's an extra cost to all of these things, and yeah. sometimes they just can't make the margin for it, they're showing you the personal side of their flock mm -hmm. and all of the things that they're doing differently to care for them that you might not have even from an organically farmed egg farmer. So yeah. I love that. Now, if um, I wanted to direct people specifically to your website, thinglogics.com, that is T-H-I-N-G-L-O-G-I-X.com. Okay. I will include links with show notes, but how do they find out about your farm specifically if they're interested in learning more? Yeah, the website for, for the ranch is barleybeef.com. Um, barleybeef.com. Yeah, I didn't have that in your guest intake form. I was like, wait, what was that again? I know I wrote it down, but then I couldn't find it. So yeah, and that'll, that'll give you all the information about, you know, kind of our practices and what we do and, and um, you know, how we think. And if we sell, we mainly focus locally. You know, um, but I'm also, I'll see if I can get some beef down to you next time in the, I'm down there because I uh, would love for you to try it. Well, I'd love that. Okay. So thank you so much for joining me today. This has been awesome. Thanks, Green. I appreciate you having me. Thank you for joining us on this journey today for a discussion that meandered a bit through the internet of technology, the internet of things, and into real applications that you might not have thought of before. Hey, we got to know a rancher here who has become a technologist of sorts and really understand how this can even impact our usage of water. Technology isn't the enemy and neither is your rancher. Get to know them. Get to know who you're buying your products from. And don't be afraid of the things that technology can add. Ultimately, it will help us manage our resources as time goes on, which is critically important, especially as those ice caps melt and we get less water on the annual basis. Now, if you want to find out more, you can always come to caremorebebetter.com. That is my website. We have complete show notes there, including transcripts and even direct links to each item we discussed today, including those earlier episodes of the podcast, including my interview with the amazing Mo Gaudet, who was the chief business officer for Google X. Incredible interview with an incredible man, and he really helped you to understand AI and why we should not necessarily be afraid of it because it can be our friend too. Listen, thank you all for joining us today. This has been my pleasure to host the show. Please join me in welcoming Rob Rastovich into your community. Give him a follow on social channels and let's see what he's up to next. Thank you now and always for being a part of this pod and this community because together we can do so much more. We can care more and we can be better. We can even regenerate Earth. Thanks for listening to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for social good. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And share with your friends to help us reach more people and spread more social good.